Over to you, sir. Hi, uh, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, you have here, uh, Ramble John Gubbleton. I'm the Department of the Navy's budget officer here, uh, actually communicating to you uh, from the Pentagon. And I'm certainly pleased to be with you here today for this panel about the uh, PPBE or resourcing the future fight and, the, and to discuss the current Uh, it looks like the Admiral is having a little bit of uh, technical trouble as he's had some trouble getting in. Admiral, are you able to join us? Otherwise, um, <laughs> maybe I'll just kind of surreptitiously uh, jump in here and welcome you guys to this panel on financing the future fight, which is uh, challenges and opportunities for planning, programming, budgeting, execution reform, and we should all be Super stoked about that because we have a PBBE reform commission uh, that is, uh, you know, now underway, and it looks like a lot of that machination is actually starting to move. So a lot of exciting things to happen. But we have, you know, an awesome lineup of panelists here to discuss. And again, um, Admiral Grumbleton, Grumbleton, just jump in here when uh, if you can get back on um, and take this over from me. But um, of course. Um, my name is Eric Lofgren with George Mason University. Um, we also have Stephanie Young from Rand Corporation, and she doesn't have a paper, but she she has uh, amazing background on this, uh, having written her dissertation on the history of PBBE and all of that as well. So we're happy to have her uh, join us in this discussion. And then, of course, we have John Schmidt from Rand, who has done a great paper on Mosaic and the intersection of that with resource allocation and J John Wong also from RAND. So me and a number of RAND folks excited to have them. Um, and John Wong has also an excellent paper looking at the different value structures of alternatives to the PBBE. But I think, you know, what we wanted to do here was actually, we're going to give each of us kind of like a, a, a brief little time to discuss what we have done in our research and then get into a nice conversation. And so please put your, your questions into the chat where we'll be monitoring that and looking forward to answering those. But I'm actually going to start us off because my paper is more on kind of like the history of, of the budget process and execution flexibility. And so I'm going to share my screen here um, for a quick presentation uh, that hopefully will be uh, useful to you guys. But what we have here, what I really wanted to do was, you know, I had a lot of questions from folks that just said, oh, well, you're talking about, you know, budget reform. We've had this method for the past 250 years of uh, you know, America, right? So this is how democracies do it. And I was like, well, no, that's actually not true. We had a traditional way of financial uh, management and resource allocation that existed up through the 1960s. And then we had a radical, very radical break. And I can't stress how radical the break was that PBBE really is um, in terms of how it changed the decision structures in the Department of Defense. And so, you know, if we want to move from these kind of program stovepipes toward something more like a portfolio management structure, something like the traditions that we've had in the department in the years past, but also reflects modern agile principles that commercial industry uses, and as well as international organizations. You know, a couple of the, the points that I wanted to show here was, you know, the department actually did have these this type of execution flexibility in the past and that execution flexibility came with you know different styles and greater levels of oversight to keep the department accountable um, to those budget portfolios and so i just want to show you very quick i'm going to run through this um, the traditional budgeting structure prior to 1952 or fiscal year 1952 was actually based on organizations right so you see um, appropriation there at the top ordnance service and supplies. Of course, the ordnance service had all of the army's, you know, arsenals throughout uh, the United States. A lot of the money went through them. They were cognizant over a lot of like the artillery, the ordnance and all of that kind of stuff. There's other um, departments or organizations that had their own appropriation. So it, individual organization basically owned a lump sum appropriation. Um, so you had like the engineering service, the quartermaster services, signal corps, all of these um, and then underneath them, they had line items. 
right? And the Eric, line items themselves. Eric, I'm yeah, sorry please. to interrupt. Can you um, do presenter mode? We can't see your slides very well. Oh, you cannot. Is that better? No. No, it no, it, it was, but it it's still small like before. Um, well, apologies. I do not know how to blow that up. Um, but hopefully you guys can kind That'll of work. see, yeah. see what's okay. going on here. Basically, you have just a, a few number of line items underneath an appropriation. And these line items are really budget portfolios, right? Procurement of artillery, procurement of ammunition. One large portfolio, it's not like individual pro project line items are, are being uh, displayed here and controlled. So the, the tagline is there's wide latitude in program choice and execution flexibility delegated down to the commands, the bureaus and the technical services who could make cost schedule technical trade-offs in the year of execution, right? Uh, on the basis of these more broader uh, budget portfolios and the way that they would actually, they would prov provide project level data um, in terms of appropriations hearings, but they weren't necessarily directly tied to the budget. There was some flexibility. So the government wouldn't you know, specify an exact level of service. There would be a lump, what they used to call lump sum appropriation, and then they would optimize um, allocation within that. So in 1952, we actually had the, the performance budgeting, uh, which reorganized the appropriations from those organizational appropriations to what we see today, the military personnel maintenance and operations, uh, procurement and production, research and development. Um, so that's starting to look like what we have today, but still, um, even though the appropriations were reorganized, the services retained substantial discretion in weapons acquisition. There was not project line items. Congress did not control project line items um, in, in that way. Now, here's a budget presentation from FY 1956, and you'll see that underneath these appropriations that look like today's major procurement and production, you have a standard set of larger programs. Again, still budget portfolios. And in many cases, comptrollers would be able to move money between these line items uh, without going to the Congress. Now, the custom had been, if a movement between line items had been very large, they would go to Congress and get um, approval or feedback. But smaller types of changes, uh, between these line items wouldn't require that. And within a line item, there is much more flexibility indeed. Now, where did PBBE come in, right? What did it do? So we have the budget structure that was traditional, but then we also have a program structure. And the whole point of the program structure was to optimize weapon systems outcomes through basically prediction and analysis. Um, and then you would lock in a baseline and execute to that baseline over a number of years. And Stephanie will talk a little bit about that. But through the 1960s, right, in 1961, McNamara, Robert McNamara came in. He decided to implement this PBBE, which actually came from RAND, right? So Charles Hitch, who was the economics uh, division head at RAND, and many of his collaborators actually came up with this PBBE idea it was published in a book in 1960, implemented in the department in 1961, and then 63 was the first year that it was actually built into the budget. But still, Congress only appropriated and conducted oversight for the most part based on the budget structure. So you can see there on the left, um, that was what was submitted to Congress. It looked very much like what had been happening in the 50s, whereas this, um, you know, the program structure was not made public, and, the, and Congress actually was fearful a little bit of the, the program structure itself for many years for many reasons. Uh, we don't really have too much time to get into that, but I will note that in 1961, 59 to 61, uh, reprogramming actually started to become uh, bigger. 56 was the first year we've ever heard. There was no such thing as reprogramming before, um, but by 1961, you had control of reprogramming at this, what is called the rdt and &E sub-activity level. Um, and it was really only prior approval to Congress was only for things uh, omitted by Congress. So if Congress specifically reduced um, a project, if it's a congressional interest item, and if there's an increase in procurement quantities. So those changes between, you know, that flexibility between, you know, one ship to another ship, that was still the purview of the Department of Defense 
where the Secretary of Defense had to sign off on it and just give notification to Congress. But Congress didn't have prior approval over all of the types of rules, the $10 million or 20%, that kind of rule. That was actually uh, not um, that was actually not provided to Congress as a prior approval back in that time. So not only did you have budget portfolios that persisted through the 60s, there was actually great flexibility in, able, in, in the ability to move funding, funding around between line items. So again, layers of control have been added by PBBE in the 60s, but Congress continued to make budget decisions in the same format as the, as the 1950s. And it wasn't until 1972, I went through all the appropriations hearings to find when did the, the current program element structure actually get presented in the president's budget? Um, and that was actually 1972. And you'll see in this just little exhibit here that you already have RDT and E budget activities that we have today, the same ones, exploratory development, for example, for 6.2. You have program elements and you have projects underneath that all fully costed. Program elements uh, were never actually, they're, all that information was redacted in the 1960s appropriations hearings or discussions. They were never really like actually fully present or public. And so the tagline here, Congress begins using PBBE as the primary policy lever, lever kind of in the 1970s timeframe. And then the other side, of course, as I've been saying, of budget portfolios is reprogramming. And we can see here, I've stitched together a lot of reprogramming as a percent of the budget over time. It was relatively high in the 60s and then precipitously fall, fell after the Nixon impoundment. So we can see when there's a, a lack of trust between executive and legislative, the legislative actually like um, pulls down that, uh, that flexibility from the government. And the tagline here is that from, you know, the founding of, from our founding fathers through the 1960s, we had a traditional paradigm of budget portfolios and execution flexibility. And in general, agility and effectiveness had been increasing over this time. There were a lot of sensible uh, budgetary changes. The PBBE paradigm, however, based on program stovepipes and execution control, has actually been corresponding with a lot of additional paperwork and cycle times increasing. And so what I want you to take away from this is budget portfolios and execution flexibility is consistent with the United States tradition of liberal democracy and congressional power of the purse and military plans and resources can be successfully related through budgetary and non-budgetary means. That was the primary way um, a lot of these decisions were made in the 50s and before through extra budgetary means. Um, and portfolios depend on value-driven methods of reporting and oversight, which focus on outcomes and individual responsibility. So if we provide additional execution flexibility, then there needs to be those kinds of stronger methods of oversight to make sure that things have been actually going well. So I'll turn it over to, to Stephanie here. I've talked long enough. Um, Stephanie, please come on in. Thanks so much, Eric. Um, it's, it is such a pleasure for me to have the opportunity to, to engage with Eric, um, who's so thoughtful historically about these issues and the rest of my colleagues. So I, I'm Stephanie Young. I'm the director of the Resource Management Program at Ranch Project Air Force. Um, as, as Eric mentioned, I, I, I did my, my work, my academic work at, as in, in graduate school on the history of the PPB, e, um, PPBE, and uh, I've, I've been passionate about it for years, and I'm really energized by the current debate around, you know, how to, ref, how to reform it or how to transform it for the current threat environment. So I, I just wanted to, in the spirit of, of, you know, thinking historically about these issues, I wanted to, to talk a little bit about the, the intent of the, of the of, of those um, analysts that, that developed PPBE and uh, implemented it in, in uh, Kennedy um, White House in 1963, uh, uh, I guess, um, when it was first the first budget. Um, so, uh, so going back, so um, Eric mentioned that that a lot of these these methodological innovations came from Rand, and a lot of the folks who who worked on this were were some of the senior leaders charged with implementing it in, in the Pentagon. Um, and the so I want to just talk a little bit about what their what what the rationale was. You know what what was the need they were they were thinking of when they were when they were um, you know considering ways to to restructure uh, the way the Department of Defense made decisions about resource allocations. Um, so the I, I want to go back. So Eric mentioned um, Charles Hitch, who was um, the Comptroller um, Robert McNamara's first Comptroller, um, and he was uh, the head of the Economics Department at Rand prior to that role. Um, and he, so Eric mentioned this, this book that is well known, the Economics of Defense in the, in the Nuclear Age. Um, and he has a quote that I'm fond of in that book um, that I think uh, 
clarify some of what the intent was uh, with this, these new decision-making apparatus. So Charles Hitch said, um, there is no budget size or cost that is correct regardless of payoff, and there is no need that should be met regardless of cost. The job of economizing, which some would delegate to budgeteers and comptrollers, cannot be distinguished from the whole task of making military decisions. Um, and there's another quote that is more often cited that I think is in a similar spirit from Bernard Brody, also a RAND um, analyst um, in this period, um, that he said, strategy wears a dollar sign. Um, and both of these quotations suggest that the decisions about strategy and resources need to be considered together, ends and means need to be considered together if, if the, if the nation is going to make sensible decisions about how to prioritize where to take risk. Um, so the, when, when the, the PBBE performers or the, the cohort um, were developing some of these methodological innovations, they were looking to develop tools that would facilitate um, an assessment of, 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 um, uh, of what the nation was getting for its investment and how much it costs. So um, the, the sort of the, the ends and the means, they, they needed to establish those things that they're going to facilitate um, decision making. So the on the on the sort of um, in the spirit. Uh, so it's a, so to inform explicit choices about how much is enough, they needed to understand um, how much. So what they were getting uh, for their investment. So that meant output oriented budgets. So rather than saying you're spending this much on on military personnel or this much on O and M, um, you, that you were you were getting a military capability out of that strategic retaliatory forces, general purpose for forces, mobility forces, you're getting something that that is that is output oriented. Um, and they also you and they also wanted to have some mechanism for tracking the cost of those things, not just in a year of execution, but over the year of putting in place that capability. So bundling the RDT and E, the procurement, Milcon, Milpers, you know, different costs that are associated with that capability, putting it into a program, into a, a program package that would facilitate um, uh, you know, more transparency about how much a thing is going to cost. So that, that was the intent here, to, to have output-oriented budgets and budgets that were inclusive of the costs associated with, with, with developing or fielding that capability. Um, and they needed to do that over a time horizon. You know, that's not going to be in one year. And they, they wanted to have a five-year plan that, that, that looked at how these things were going, were going to, um, the costs were going to uh, be associated with it over time. So that's the intent. And so part, so part of the, one of the key questions, as I mentioned, is you know, how much is enough? And that, that is the sort of ends and means. But also, uh, you know, central to this, and I and I, I know this is something that um, will be that's core of the current discussion. Is another key question for them was who gets to decide? Because those, who, you know, how much is enough is not a value-free uh, question. Um, it really very much depends on where your institutional, where you sit institutionally. Um, and there, and for for the reformers of the time, um, they were very interested in empowering the Secretary of Defense to make these decisions to make. Decisions about about um, you know at enterprise level trades across the services, uh, and that that was so you know this office, office assistance analysis, which is currently CAPE, was a capability that was set up to make um, some of these uh, cross program um, uh, in decisions, uh, explicit choices about where to take risk and where to prioritize. Um, so I I want to um, so I wanted to just lay that out because I, I do think that. The, those objectives um, are are absolutely enduring. I mean, the idea that you need to have a resource allocation decision that that facilitates explicit choices um, that that is that is that is something that that remains um, a capability and that we that we need to be that we should be seeking from our from any sort of reform PPBE system. Um, and you know, there there will continue to be questions around around you know what my, my colleague John Wong will call values. I mean, about how to you know what what are those features of the resource allocation system that you want to prioritize? Those are choices. You know, those are those are not those are not um, a product of of the system itself. It's rather uh, a, a, it, it is a it, it will be it will depend on um, on the institutional actor, and it could well be that the the resource allocation system needed might be tailored uh, for for different kinds of investments or different kinds of institutional actors. So um, I, with that, I'll pass it over to um, my colleague. Um, but I did just want to set set a sort of historical foundation to understand what was the intent, or why is this thing in place, um, so that we can think about, you know, as we as we talk about how to transform it, or you know, areas where it may not be meeting the current threat environment, um, or you know, ways in which that structure, that output oriented structure, which reflected the threat environment in the '60s, does not reflect the threat environment now. I mean, so there there are very there are lots of ways we can we can talk about. 
um, areas where where reform might be necessary. Um, but I wanted to, to at least start with the foundation of, of you know, why is this in place and uh, what aspects of it um, are, should we keep in mind as, as core elements um, that we should seek to retain? Um, so I guess, Eric, unless you want to say anything, I'll pass it over to John Wong. I'll take, uh, I'll take that as a, as a yes. Uh, thanks, Stephanie. Um, and Eric and Andrew Gumbleton for kind of teeing this up. I'm going to start sharing my screen here, but um, I am really cheered by the fact that we're all focused on on values here. Um, and, and please yell if uh, if if uh, my presentation isn't uh, isn't showing up because that's kind of where my head was at with uh, with PVBE as I kind of started to see the uh, the proposals for reform and the conversation really start to pick up in a way that hasn't in you know in uh, in, in quite some time. And that was kind of you know, my motivation here. You know, like I said, PPB is on everyone's mind, uh, particularly because it's, uh, you seem to identify that as a, as a particular obstacle for, uh, for easier adoption of commercial technologies. Uh, but something was interesting to me was that there was, a lot, there was a lot missing in the conversation because there was a lot of emphasis on, on what the values uh, that we're trading off on between the status quo, the current PPB system, any kind of future reform proposal, whether it's PPBE or you know any other kind of resource allocation process. I really wanted to kind of dig in, dig in deeper in there. What are the values of PPB reform proposals? What are they emphasizing? And I did that by you know by a lot of reading, uh, by you know taking uh, a lot of the literature, including stuff that uh, that Eric and Stephanie and, and John Schmidt, who will follow me. Uh, ha have written, uh, take a look at the public administration literature about uh, resource allocation, and really trying to organize, uh, organize you know, both, uh, try to the, pr the proposals themselves for reform, as well as the values that they imply, uh, and what, uh, what values they, uh, they, they seem to emphasize or, or not. I'm happy to chat later on about how I did this, you know, a lot of literature review, uh, and a good bit of uh, pile sorting there. But this is what, it, what, what kind of came, came to the fore here in terms of values, kind of, there's four here. Uh, that seem to be uh, pretty uh, pretty evident in, the, uh, in in my review. One is consistency. Is there is that process? Is that going to produce something that is uh, stable over the long term? You can count on having you know a, a kind of a steady on ramp or off ramp uh, as you kind of switch uh, switch priorities and resource allocation. Flip side of that is agility. Can you quickly pivot uh, and kind of get those things that, that that you want that you didn't uh, you didn't plan for you know uh, three years ago, five years ago, or something like that. Um, coherence, as Stephanie pointed out, you want to connect strategy to uh, resource allocation. When you kind of total that all up and you kind of do your process, uh, does that budget that results, is that going to reflect the strategy in a way that, that makes sense? Uh, and then lastly, transparency. Is that process going to be a black box or is it open to inspection? Is it open for, for oversight? And those four values kind of came out uh, pretty consistently throughout, uh, throughout my time looking at the, uh, uh, looking at the literature. Also in there were the proposals themselves. There are probably, gosh, like, oh, I, I want to say like 22 documents I looked at, and about 14 had proposals. Uh, we, can, we can talk later about why some of those documents didn't have proposals and just kind of you know, admire the problem here. Uh, but they all kind of lined up into five broad buckets, and I'll kind of describe them very quickly. The first one is just you know, being, you know, doing PPBE better, you know, being more disciplined about the execution process, you know, maybe some streamlining, maybe some, uh, some things like that. Uh, the second one kind of gets at what, what Eric was talking about, the, the, the different units of analysis, uh, the different uh, size, grain sizes, so to speak, of, uh, uh, of the uh, of, of pieces of the budget that, that you would analyze. Uh, in, in this case, a lot of the, uh, a lot of the proposals that, that I looked at, reform proposals I looked at, uh, looked at changing either the major force programs or the way program elements are aggregated. Uh, and, and assembling in different ways so that you can kind of you can kind of make them make sense for some of the technology that you're looking to acquire uh, today. More extreme than that are integrated portfolios, and so that's kind of taking all the appropriation titles together, uh, you know, O and M, uh, procurement, RDT, and E, and putting them all in, in, in one spot, uh, kind of like the way you saw the old JIDO uh, organization work in its uh, in its heyday. And then another proposal here is you know just taking. Taking RDT and E, for instance, uh, uh, out of the you know out of the out of the game and, and returning it back to kind of the uh, the annual budgeting that that Eric described so well, and I think it was like your second or third slide there. Uh, so taking RDT and out of the uh, the fit of, uh, and then lastly, the, the last proposal uh, kind of theme of proposals I, uh, that I saw were more powerful reprogramming. So uh, you know 
in the same way, again, you know, Eric, I'm gonna have to steal that slide of yours sometime on reprogramming. That was really, really well done. Uh, but but bringing reprogramming back in a more in a in a more powerful way, uh, allowing greater flexibility in, in shifting uh, shifting funds around. So you've got values, you've got the reform proposals. I was really interested in seeing how those two wind up together. Admittedly, this is just one guy in Santa Monica kind of thinking about this. And but I really want to ask myself a question: All these different proposals are they going to increase or decrease emphasis on one of those four values compared to the status quo? You can kind of see, you know, there's some broad holistic judgments that, that I made there. They can, you, know, you can, if, if we were all in Monterey, we could debate this over a beer or something. Um, but here's the, 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 the kind of key takeaways that I'm going to leave you with. One is that you're always going to see consistency and agility kind of at, in, in tension with each other. Yeah, that, that kind of makes sense, right? Because if you're looking for something that's kind of more steady, you know, steady stream, uh, you're not going to change very much. You know, you're not obviously not going to be very, uh, very agile. And so what that means, at least from, from where, I, where I've kind of looked at it, was that the other two values, coherence and transparency, those will be the key differentiators. Those are the ones that are going to um, put one, uh, you know, one set of proposals uh, ahead of another. But, you know, how do you, how do you choose between those? You know, there's no clear choice because I don't know which one of these values is more, uh, is, is, should be emphasized more by the organization. And that's going to be, I think, really, uh, really difficult to, uh, uh, to to do for 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 any of us kind of looking at the at the problem from uh, from the outside. And so, what that means is that you know, however, you know, however you do that, bringing you first have to bring out those values themselves. You have to bring those ex values explicitly into the into the policy conversation in a way that I don't think we've seen a yet uh, in in the PPPE uh, reform debate. You know, I could be wrong. There could be you know. Five other uh, uh, values that that I didn't think about, uh, or you might define them differently. But whatever that is, in order to kind of get at, I think a a resource allocation reform uh, that is enduring, that is uh, that's that that works for that works for um, as many stakeholders as possible. You kind of have to bring the organizational value question uh, into the explicit conversation in a way that it hasn't uh, hasn't been before. And I see we're probably short on time here. So I'm going to stop there and pass it off to John Schmidt, who's going to talk about uh, potentially ways of, of instantiating it with, uh, with Mosaic Warfare. All right. Um, thanks, John. Um, all right. I will share some slides here, but my focus will be on um, a project that we completed recently that looks at the kind of the intersection of a DARPA's notion of a mosaic force um, and the status quo acquisition system. How, how, how do those interact with each other? Um, and we looked broadly at kind of the big A acquisition structures. Um, for this talk, I'll focus exclusively on the portions of that um, that deal with resourcing. So um, without further ado, uh -oh. All right. Sorry, guys. Um, it's not letting me share. Hold on. Um, Carrie, do you have my slides there that you can project? It's, I have to change my system settings, it's telling me. Carrie, are you there? Do you have my slides available? Yes, I'm here and I'm getting them up right now. Okay, cool. Can you see them? Perfect. Okay, thank you. Yeah, it, um, we are a Teams company. Um, so I'm glad that we had that backup. Okay, so... Uh, you can skip to the next slide, please. Thank you. Okay, so a, a brief overview on the project. Um, so DARPA Stowe, the Strategic Technologies Office, has put forth, I should say in particular, this is led by Dr. Tim Grace, and it's really championed the notion of mosaic. Um, but they have a, an, an idea of mosaic warfare that, that really sees uh, mosaic as both a means of uh, conducting war fighting, um, but also... Um, uh, a means of dramatically accelerating the, the overall capability and development, um, capability uh, and fielding process. 
Um, so our project project here focuses on the latter of those two. That is, we focus on um, the defense acquisition system uh, writ large. Um, and in studying that intersection, we stipulated two research questions uh, that are provided here. So the first is, are DOD's existing requirements, resourcing, um, and, and um, acquisition systems compatible with fielding a mosaic type force? Uh, in other words, are those management systems capable of handling the dramatic increase in throughput uh, and distinct types of capabilities envisioned by Mosaic. Uh, and the second question is, if the existing system is not capable of handling such throughput, um, what might an alternative acquisition system look like? Um, I won't touch so much on the kind of uh, the, the, those alternative structures here, um, but happy to address them in the Q&A. Um, so the way we answer uh, this question is using a gaming methodology. Um, next slide, please. Um, so the, the essence of the, the war game in which I'll touch on um, in a second was to, in, in essence, create a, a simulated environment uh, whereby stakeholders represent kind of status quo DOD interests, um, and we present to them um, a, a series of kind of acquisition events. But, but more on that later. What, what am I talking about when I say mosaic warfare? Um, often a mosaic force is drawn in contrast uh, to the current force or in contrast to uh, the use of monolithic platforms. So uh, monolithic platforms such as the F-35 or Virginia class subs um, uh, can be conceptualized as those that have um, lots of capabilities integrated onto a single, a single platform. Uh, Mosaic, in contrast, envisions uh, disaggregating these capabilities onto distinct physical platforms, um, and then those platforms themselves can be composed and recomposed um, at the tactical level on tactical timelines. Um, there's an important um, kind of implication that's associated with this de disaggregation of capabilities um, between the, or rather on the relationship between uh, kind of capability fielding and time. And that's shown in this top uh, right chart there. So in the current model where um, you have these, uh, the language is monolithic platforms released on kind of every 15 or 20 year timelines, the relationship between time and capabilities kind of follows a stepwise function. That is a new platform comes online, there's a large jump in capability, but between these cycles, um, there's less improvement. So uh, one of the objectives of Mosaic as we view it um, is to have a much more robust um, and diverse technology pipeline, uh, kind, of, kind of shown there in the animation, um, whereby new Mosaic modules or tiles are constantly coming online. Um, and this should result in a smoother relationship between capability fielding and time as shown in the, the, the linear uh, plots there. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so a little bit about game design. Um, so the game we designed for this project is set in a future uh, in which the United States continues to advance uh, the strategic priorities outlined in the 2018 NDS. Uh, we say that overall military competition between the United States remains contested. Uh, and we are trying, uh, participants are, are focused on deterring a Chinese invasion scenario in Taiwan. Uh, we split the game into three days. Uh, the first was focused on uh, whether or not the existing acquisition apparatus could uh, uh, kind of accommodate mosaic type acquisitions. Uh, and the, the second two focused on uh, potential alternative um, acquisition structures and whether or not those would do a better job and in which ways um, they, they didn't um, and inquiring a similar set uh, of capabilities. Um, next slide, please. So here, a little bit um, more about the mosaic and its um, implications for acquisition. So the, the basic logic of mosaic tiles or capabilities um, can be expected in our view to have some positive effects on acquisition outcomes absent any uh, major acquisition reform, uh, specifically by embracing the, the attributes of fractionation and composability. Um, we, th there might be anticipated certain uh, the kind of the initiation of certain virtuous cycles. Uh, so just looking at one of these here, um, by fractionating systems, the kind of number or the stringency um, of requirements that are associated with any given system might be expected to decrease. Uh, this in turn uh, could accelerate schedule. 
Um, and the accelerated schedules can then allow uh, for the, the kind of fitting of capabilities to the most proximate threats and further reduce the kind of requirements creep that's associated with very long uh, uh, planning horizons. I'm happy, happy to, I, I realized that I went through those pretty quickly. Again, happy to answer those uh, during the Q&A. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so here are um, a set of the type of kind of acquisition events um, that we looked at in the course of the game. Um, this is a, a sample, but it gives an idea of um, the type of acquisitions we were trying to see if the status quo system um, could, could accommodate. So I won't go through these in much detail, but to give a sense of, uh, of the speed anticipated and the number of distinct events, um, that, that players were dealing with, um, I'll go through a little bit of what happens in the first year of capability threat A, which is um, kind of a, uh, something that Mosaic and I think all of us hope to be able to accommodate. It's kind of a technological opportunity that emerges in being able to respond quickly to kind of a serendip serendipitous you know, technological breakthrough. So, so in this case, a, a small firm demonstrates a promising new Eland sensor um, tested on a rotary ring UAS at White Sands. So that's that's the kind of the initiation of the sequence. Um, then, you know, it's found that analysis shows that the sensor outperforms um, other fielded Eland sensors. And then an inline, sorry, an in-year decision is made to fund integration of that sensor onto fielded um, aerostat platforms. So it's fielded on a distinct platform on which it was tested. Uh, the, the, the firm in question is then put onto contract. Um, the, uh, the next step is that a prime contractor uh, delivers and installs an initial set of sensors onto aerostats um, assigned to a naval task force ahead of a Pacific exercise. And finally, um, the new integrated sensors are tested on a live fire exercise as part of a new kill chain um, that uses the aerostats to cue land-based fires against naval SAMs. So, as we attempted to run um, kind of acquisition scenarios uh, through the status quo system, we identified, as you can imagine, um, several points of friction. Um, and here in the last slide, I'll focus on those points of friction as they relate to the resourcing process. Um, next slide, please. Okay. So at least um, two features of the the PPBE process um, seem to have implications for the potential of acquiring a mosaic for force. Um, first, and I should say these are well known um, to, to folks in this room. Um, first, the, the PPBE process is a calendar driven process uh, that involves uh, roughly, I should say maybe at a minimum, a two year gap between the resource allocation decision and the date at which those resources become uh, available for use. Um, this in itself forestalls the ability to realize novel capabilities via unanticipated technology opportunities. Um, I should point out that a distinction was made between kind of um, the, the the resourcing decisions during cases of exception. Um, it was thought that you know if this is a very high priority, um, resources could probably be found, and the other acquisition events could also be processed. Uh, but doing so at scale. Um, what was the major impediment here? Um, okay, so second, the second um, observation about the, the PPBE process was that, um, again, um, not a surprise, but that it's inflexible with regard to the reallocation of funds. So um, above, above the threshold reprogramming requires um, a, a fairly arduous congressional approval process. Um, when players were exploring uh, the possible means of funding the various technologies that we presented with, presented them with, um, they commented on the impracticability of relying on reprogramming for relatively small uh, uh, spends. So it was thought, um, kind of put plainly, uh, that the political cost of securing congressional approval outweighed the limited value for each of these mosaic type tiles, which are of smaller uh, value um, than a traditional program. Um, I'll, I'll close here with a, a kind of more general finding um, from the use of gaming uh, to look at acquisition issues. Um, so this, this going into this, we were there, there we realized there's kind of limited ways of um, thinking about the ways of implementing um, potential acquisition reforms, right? One can kind of use historical examples 
Um, maybe in some cases, modeling and simulation might yield insight, but the, the data here, um, is, is, is not a ton of it. Um, but we found that the use of this kind of wargaming methodology to the policy field, and in particular to the acquisition space, um, could be useful in, in, in figuring out where tensions might arise uh, for any potential acquisition reforms. Um, so that's all I got. Happy. I'm looking forward to questions. I'll probably, uh, I think we'll pass on now to Admiral Gumbleton, who I think is going to moderate the Q&A. Yeah, hey, John, thanks very much for that. <clears throat> uh, uh, could I just get a quick audio check to make sure uh, folks can hear me? We got you. Good. All right. <clears throat> so uh, this is great. So we ran through a quick panel. We have 30 minutes left for Q&A. Uh, really appreciate uh, Eric and Stephanie walking through a uh, good history lesson, if you will, where we began. Uh, I would... I would like to note that uh, as I was a moment or two late for this uh, panel, be meeting with uh, the Mr. McCord, the OC controller. Uh, so that's uh, it's alive and well in the building. And then uh, pivoting to uh, John Wong and talking about what attributes or how might we evaluate a future PPE process, whether it's through consistency, agility, coherence, transparency. And then, of course, uh, does that include the requirement? Is that baked in? So that is something we should address. And then, John, thank you for your your comments on a, a, a practical application or an illustration of how we might need to evolve or adapt as we get ready for a future high-end fight. So all, all really good comments. Um, I think what I'd like to do is, is, from my view, we talked about the flexibility of the PPBE, the two-year time frame from flash to bang, if you will. It is uh, it's a significant burden and challenge. And, and John, you mentioned at the very end about, uh, you know, the, the, the burden of, of uh, reprogramming and how long that takes. I like to tell folks it's a, it takes six consecutive miracles to get a reprogramming through Congress. It has to get through OSD Comptroller, then OMB, then, of course, pass our four service um, supervising committees, you know, HASC, SASC, and and the appropriators with HACTI and SACTI. So no small feat there. So as we pivot to this last uh, 25 minutes, what I'd like to do is I'll propose the first question and we'll run through the panelists. If I could begin with uh, the same lineup as we did with our Eric first. Uh, my first question is for our panel, um, what is a practical piece of the PPBE we would advise the commission to keep? And then what is a provocative change that you would suggest? And if I could run through our panelists with that first question, please. Sure. Um, you know, it's, it's really hard to think of something that I would want to keep from PBBE because it is an instantiation of Soviet era and literal Soviet planning methodologies, right? Um, which actually contrasts very much with our, with our values. But one thing I would like to keep from PBBE is this recognition of the link between um, you know, strategy and budgets, but particularly not tying programs to, to make that explicit, but really we, what we need is like a program evaluation function. And now OSD CAPE does program evaluation, but their version of evaluation is on future budgets, what will happen in the future. We never do a good job of actually looking back into the past at, at those actuals and what actually happened and relating those into like a real view of, of, of the history to inform those future decisions. We have very haphazard, right? Like we, we kind of reinvent the wheel every time for every milestone decision or every kind of crisis that, that, that enters and you like reconstitute all these data. So I would really like to see, you know, what actually never came through from the PBBE, which was, you know, in execution, tying together all of that obligational data to the appropriations, what account did it come from, who was responsible for it, where did they obligate it to, and what value was derived from it, and then mapping that all to the program structure. Um, so I think that is incredibly important. Uh, never really got uh, where it was supposed to, uh, but what I would change, obviously, from PBBE is, is really just you know, providing that flexibility, not requiring the full funding, because it presumes that we know 30, 40, 50 years into the future. And as we've seen decade after decade after decade, plans reality mismatch. Those 
not only are the baseline plans error laden, right? Like we don't actually execute to those and we just reevaluate every year. And so the PBBE were like, people who came up with it would be like, that's a complete, if we have to change these plans every year that we fail, there's no point to the plan, right? Um, so I would like to see slow and incremental changes towards portfolio pilots. So aggregating program elements together in logical and slow, consistent manners where it makes sense, and then giving them more general re uh, requirements. So refactoring those requirements into more top level um, you know, specifications or requirements, and then allow, and then seeing what happens, experimenting across, particularly with software and C4ISR areas that you can start, you know, like the last things we would want to do is probably the big platforms like the CVNs and the, uh, and the carriers or, or the, uh, the Columbia class, but like starting to aggregate these portfolios, experimenting with agile incremental decisions and getting away from these pre faux life cycle analyses that are really done you know, superficially, and then they never actually come to fruition. And so, um, you know, I would just say, you know, towards portfolios would be my change. And then program analysis, really focusing on that program analysis and data would be what I'd want to keep. It's uh, so I, I, I suspect that Eric and I disagree on a lot of things. But I think that there's a lot of uh, of of, um, of what he just said that I that resonates a lot with me. The thing that I definitely think is important to retain is our expectations around um, open and explicit analysis. So absolutely, some sort of program evaluation function, some expectation of planning. You know, not we can't just say that we need to be flexible. We need to be agile so that we know expectation of of, of thinking long term. There are analytic techniques for thinking about planning under uncertainty. There are there are analytic techniques for thinking about how to link strategy to resources. Um, I think that making sure that those um, that those continue to be an expectation for how program uh, how programs um, are are discussed, how resources are advocated for, um, I think is 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 absolutely critical, and I and I think that's very much aligned with um, with Eric's vision as well. Uh, I mean, there was a lot of uh, you know there there was a when PBB was rolled out, there was a sense that this was something that that you know Cape was doing, you know now then systems analysis. Um, the services developed analytic capabilities too, and and that really increased the 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 quality of the debate. Um, you know, having having um, analytic um, capabilities uh, where conversations can really happen at a different level is something we should absolutely seek to preserve. Um, on what to what would be an area for change? I mean, I I think that um, you know we there 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 is uh, no way <laughs> that the structure of the, the that was originally put in place reflects. How we would currently bend military capabilities. You know the kinds of military outputs that were that were part of those output that output budgeting in the 60s. I mean, absolutely do not reflect um, the way we currently think about joint multi-domain um, capabilities. So I, I definitely think that that a a a high level rethink of how what what are the what is the right way to bend capabilities so that like things are compared and prioritized um, relative to each other. Um, is something that I would definitely advocate for. I mean, and similarly, making sure that there's that there that our governance structures for programming decisions are well aligned to the things that we want to prioritize. So rather than having um, stovepipes that may reflect different um, different communities, making sure that we have a way of have, looking across. Um, you know, this is to John Schmidt's paper. You know, thinking about cross cutting capabilities that, that there is a mechanism for appropriately prioritizing and advocating for for resourcing those those kinds of capabilities as well because that's increasingly where I mean, this is, that's where that's where we're going so we need to make sure that that we can that we that we that our governance structures align to what we where our priorities really are um, so again i think there's a lot of a lot of um, a lot of agreement with uh, with with eric's vision on that as well um, back to you Admiral. How about you, John Wong? Well, I feel uh, I feel um, like Eric and Stephanie took all the good stuff, um, and I'm going to leave John Schmidt with, with nothing. But but here here goes. Uh, what what I would like to keep is the is the kind of intent and philosophy that PPB originally had of putting OSD in the driver's seat, taking the services and and you know making them kind of justify their decisions and, and allowing policymakers to choose. I think it's particularly important right now in this time 
uh, because you have a lot of conceptual innovation at the services. That's what a, a lot of work that I do here at Rant is, is evaluating service concepts. You know, we call it M MBO, EABO, DMO, uh, ACE. You know what? You know whatever. You know whatever the acronym of the, uh, of the day is. And so you're going to see a lot of service level innovation. And absent strong leadership uh, from from OSD, you're going to get stuff like the uh, large business buyers. Uh, kerfuffle uh, that that happened, gosh, months like six six seven months ago, where the Air Force and the Army were kind of arguing or arguing uh, with each other about you know what the role of, uh, of Army long range fires is and does not encroach on Air Force uh, equities and, and so on and so forth. You need that kind of central control, particularly as the services are innovating a lot uh, on uh, on these new concepts, which is a, which is a good thing. What I would junk, um, I would agree with Eric. I would agree with Stephanie. The grain size, the bins, uh, you know, whatever you want to call it. Uh, don't reflect um, anything that uh, don't reflect the department's priorities today in, in regards to to where it wants to go with uh, with material capabilities. Perfect example is JADC2 uh, network communications. I mean, you, yeah, I would be challenged to look at and, and try to understand and analyze uh, where our investments are uh, because they're fractionated across so many different program elements, across so many different. Uh, appropriation titles, you know, whatever, you know, whatever it is, uh, the the grain size, the bins, you know, they don't match up. And I, I, you know, haven't looked as hard at it as Eric has, but I would, I would wager a guess that they would look pretty familiar to Robert McNamara if he was alive today, and right? it would be able to make sense of it. But it doesn't make sense for us. All right, John Schmidt, I left you with nothing. Go for it. Yeah, yeah, it's implicit in the all of us having the answer is that there has to be at least four things uh, worth keeping, um, unless I'm gonna do redundancy, um, which I am, I'm gonna go with the latter there. Um, so I'll do quickly off of the, the first question. I think the, the, the most of the important things have been mentioned. Um, clearly there has to be means of establishing oversight and um, there, there, there has to remain some way of linking strategy to, um, to task or, or some kind of planning process. Um, I think part of the, question was a, a provocative inclusion. Um, I think so. So I think we should avoid using the term slush fund uh, by all means, but I think there should be flexible funds um, available for certain um, applications. And there, and this isn't uh, my idea. It's been a lot of it. It's actually been um, articulated on Eric's blog um, and it's out there in the world. But I think there are certain um, sets of capabilities um, where um, flexible funding is uh, more more flexible means of of, of resourcing is appropriate. Um, a lot of those have to might fall in the JADC2 area. Um, the th things that are uh, by nature joint, um, things related to um, you know the the, the, the C2 process, waveforms, uh, message standards, um, uh, AI, th things that are cross-cutting might be appropriate to use in a more flexible way all while maintaining. Um, we just have to rebrand it and make sure we're not using the term slush fund. <clears throat> yeah, uh, thank you very much uh, for the team for answering that question. Uh, we do have uh, a few questions posed that are pretty specific in mind. I'd invite our panelists to type out answers to some of them if they care to. Um, I'd like to ask uh, one question of our panel here is to, um, I think this flexibility notion is, is something uh, really uh, valuable and needed quality of, of a future PPPE, but so hard to achieve uh, given the congressional or uh, constitutional oversight that Congress uh, guards quite jealously and, and quite honestly, we want them to. Uh, what are, might be a thought on some technology that we could use to provide them the oversight required yet maybe achieving uh, flexibility? And uh, I'll pose that question to anyone on the panel. Over. Uh, well, maybe I'll just uh, jump in on there. Um, I think, you know, uh, former General uh, John Ferrari kind of you know, gave me a good idea on this where it's just like, you would never put your kid into a cab, but now that we have Uber with the technology where you can track it and know the reputation of the individuals driving, you're willing to put your kid in there. So trust, like the information technology can generate trust and that trust can allow for new types of behaviors and patterns to emerge. Um, so I think that's really important. And that gets back to what I was trying to say there 
um, in terms of we just need to be able to kind of trace the funds in kind of like a coherent and organized way. And the way I think that this makes a lot of sense or is important is because, you know, Stephanie was talking about, you know, how do you classify in the budget in order to make these types of decisions to connect strategy and budgets. And of course, you know, one, one thought is who does the planning? Well, that really matters, right? Is the planning someone not responsible, irresponsible, literally irresponsible, because they are not actually going to execute on the plans they're directing others to do, nor do they have the technical knowledge or being on the ground to be able to make those choices. And oftentimes these plans are shopped around through all the functionals, right? So who does the planning? It usually it should rest. If it's a future plan, it should probably rest with the people in execution. And we need to think about ways for coordinating those folks through mutual control and redundancy and overlap is actually useful, right? Because that exposes errors, who was right, who was wrong. If we knew exactly what the future held, then PBBB, PBBE works because we know we can just optimize that and then go execute to the baseline. Um, so one of the, so to get back to the point of what I was trying to say here is there's no one classification of the budget that works, period, right? Like if I think about an NC3 satellite, okay, it's a satellite, so it's space. Wait, it's communication, C4ISR. Wait, it's nuclear. Wait, it's all of these things, right? All these cross-cutting technologies, they can't fit into one of these little bins and we just lose sight because we just focus on a, on a platform stovepipe because that's the way we've always done it, right? So if we kind of move to portfolio budgets, okay, you lose some analysis from, the, from that budgetary side, but you can really increase knowledge of what's actually happening, right? Because on the back end, when I actually um, obligate a fund to something, then I can tag it with multiple multi-dimensional tags, right? And be able to cut and slice the data in multiple different ways to inform that future, right? And so when we had the B-52, for example, and there was a story in, in my paper where Wilford McNeil is basically like, the PBBE guys come in, they say, we have no way of knowing what is like the strategy, right? We have a strategy, we have budgets, we have no way of knowing like how we're meeting that. And Wilfred McNeil was just like, what are you talking about? You can look at the inventory, you can look at resource allocations and, and cost data and, and numerous types of study. You know exactly how much you have and that can inform your decision of where you're going in the future. And when we invested in the B-52, it's not like we built the B-52 without knowing the long range budgetary implications. So there was always methods of, of, of making these um, trade-offs between you know, strategy and budgets. And so I think, yes, if we invest more on that back end to understand the traceability of what's actually happening, map that up to multiple types of program structures and use that to inform future decisions, but not tie the hands of the people actually doing the work, right? And continuous evaluation, um, then you actually have a very accountable structure based on our principles of individual responsibility. And so I challenge the fact that you know, this current system is the way that a democracy or the United States works, because my paper was all about that's not the way it worked up through the 60s. And oversight was superior, superior. I'll say that again. Oversight was superior back in that time. And PBBE, through its fixation on baselines and execution to a fixed thing, um, kind of ruined that in a way. So I'll stop there. All right. Well, uh, thank you very much. Er, and um you know, I can't help but note that uh, <clears throat> perhaps as I learned from uh, your presentation, Eric and Stephanie, is that I, I should thank my partners here at RAND for giving me this PPBE process that, from which I get to live. So thank you, team. <laughs> so let me ask you the next question, uh, maybe over to uh, John Schmidt. Um, there's a question posed by our audience about wargaming policy is an interesting application. Um, Interested in thoughts of the potential benefit or application uh, to wargaming acquisition strategies themselves. And then I would expand that maybe over to wargaming, uh, what a future PPBE process may be. Uh, John, over to you first, and then anyone else who'd care to jump in, over. Yeah, um, it's a great question. So our experience was that there, there were several benefits, um, some of which were intended and some of which were pleasant surprises. Um, what we intended and did come out was uh, we thought that Wargaming offers an, uh, an opportunity to identify sources of tension or what we called antibodies um, from kind of status quo interests ahead of time. 
Um, so th in some cases, these were may maybe predictable, um, you know, inter-service or, um, you know, in, in others, they weren't. Um, so I think that's one benefit, um, to be explicit about knowing ahead before a policy is implemented uh, where tension might uh, emerge. Um, we, there, there was also a benefit that we see, which is that it, it's useful, and this was kind of, it should go in the unanticipated, um, a useful way of kind of socializing these ideas. Um, as you bring in um, stakeholders from, you know, from the building in various parts of the enterprise, um, uh, and they begin to engage with these ideas, first of all, it, it offers a channel of just receiving new ideas into the kind of policy, policy creation process, um, but also um, begins to start conversations in various places um, about these ideas. So um, the, the final one I'll mention is that probably our, 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 our meta finding um, it, that, that might generalize across um, policy gaming was that a kind of point solution that we thought we had designed, um, you know, all our best thinking, it, it, this alternative uh, acquisition apparatus that seemed at least in my mind, um, optimized um, uh, is kind of a quixotic task in, in that really a lot of these policy options exist on a trade space uh, where there's going to be uh, trade-offs associated with the amount of kind of institutional China broken, that is the kind of the heartburn it creates the other entities and the speed or the degree of implementation. Um, so we think that the policy gaming can be useful in kind of mapping out that trade space um, more explicitly. Over. Yeah, thank you, John. Uh, would anyone else care to jump in on that? Over. Yeah, I'll, I'll chime in. This is John Wong. Um, and, you know, I, I didn't get to observe John Schmidt's game, but uh, some of the members from his team went on to work with me on, on another acquisition uh, policy related game. And I'll just offer a couple observations about uh, the process. It is a tremendous undertaking to kind of set the rules, uh, to design the rules in a way uh, that um, uh, invite new thinking, invite new players, invite new, new thinking, and, and don't result in folks kind of fighting, fighting the scenario and fighting, uh, fighting the rules. It is tremendously hard to, to do that. Uh, it's also tremendously hard to kind of articulate the, the gameplay itself in a way that for, for acquisition policy, I think it, 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 this is the this is most most evident to stylize it so you can actually play it. We had like poker chips on a on a, a virtual board game uh, for for this acquisition policy game that we that we did. Stylizing in a way that makes uh, that 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 doesn't take away too much from um, uh, from you know from the interplay, from the decisions, from the conversation stuff because that's really what the heart of uh, of a gaming effort is is kind of seeing that interplay take place and, and observing that. Uh, and using that to inform decisions, not the, you know, not the outputs of the game itself, usually. Yeah, thank you, John. <clears throat> As I look at our time, I believe we have about uh, eight minutes left. And so uh, what I'd like to do is, is give all our panelists um, a final opportunity um, to uh, address our, our group here. And I'll give you a moment to collect some thoughts. Um, from my view, what I'd like to share with our audience is, I think one of our most significant challenges with our current system, of course, is this uh, two-year time delay from uh, planning or yes, planning to execution. And that can manifest itself in many different ways. Um, most recently, of course, is, is we all here observe uh, uh, pay at the fuel pump and how we absorb costs and execution with uh, whether it happens to be an inflation uh, or, um, or fuel price hikes uh, caused by uh, invasions into Ukraine. So these are literally uh, billion dollar problems in execution. So uh, for me personally, um, <clears throat> flexibility without having a slush fund because that's neither auditable or would never meet uh, with approval of Congress. But how is it that we gain these flexibilities to do the nation's bidding is a, is quite honestly a weighty and consequential problem that we, that I hope this PPBE commission has an opportunity to uh, address. So um, uh, I believe I'll personally have an opportunity to uh, speak with the commission as will other folks. Uh, so I really, uh, 
appreciate the opportunity to be here with the panel and this group uh, to discuss this important issue. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to uh, the group here for uh, essentially a wraparound for any points you'd care to meet, uh, make. And we'll begin with you, Eric, please. Sure, thanks. Um, yeah, I think the one thing I would like to say is, what is PBBE? The only thing that's innovative about it is the programming process. We've always had planning. We've always had budgeting execution. The only thing that's unique and innovative about PBBE is the programming process, the idea of a program of record. There was no such thing as a program of record before um, PBBE. There was no two-year timeline. There's no like, you know, technology is moving faster than the, our ability to even like get money for it. That didn't exist before then. So we really need to focus PBB reform on the program of record concept. And the only, the one thing I'll kind of, you know, say here on that is that, you know, I think we're seeing today folks in oversight struggling with multiple pathways from the adaptive acquisition framework. The whole idea of of PBBE and the program of record is life cycle cost, predict everything out and then execute to that thing. That's obviously not like, reasonable for most things that are happening, especially in software, AI, and, and these other types of new technologies. So we just have to go back to a more incremental agile approach. And PBBE is the exact opposite of that, right? So we can have elements of the budget that look like PBBE for major platform investments, but we need diversity in resource allocation methodologies um, in order to actually improve because mosaic warfare is antithetical to PBBE in my view, um, tagline. Uh, so I, I would just leave um, with the, the, the group with the, the, the observation that this conversation is really about, um, you know, how, the, how our, 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 our military um, develops field capability, supports warfighter needs, it's about the biggest questions for the Department of Defense. It's not. This is not about budgeting. It's not. This is not small. This is. These are big, big questions, and I and I and I and I hope the conversation today is, has emphasized that. Um, and then, as far I mean, I think that that you know the, the question that I would, would pose is you know what what does the current threat requir environment require our resourcing system to to, to do? Um, that's the first question, and and I think that there are, there's been discussion around flexibility, agility, speed. Um, and those are those are attributes that that might be pursued. I think that there there might be an opportunity to think about you know where what parts of the overall DoD portfolio is that the appropriate answer for, and which ones is it not? Um, and and I think that there you know thinking about tailored approaches, I think is is you know is something that we should that that we should definitely consider um, because I do think that that you know starting with first principles um, might not may, might focus on you know RDT any budget you know or talk, talked about software talked about AI you know are there particular things for which this is a fit. So um, I think that's it. Over to you, John Wong. Yeah, thanks, Stephanie. I would, you know, my thoughts as we kind of wrap this up are, you know, just understanding, you know, I really try to tell myself, remind myself that PPBE kind of met the moment, you know, but that moment was, you know, 1960, you know, uh, and to, 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 uh, uh, to maybe the, the mid seventies or something like that. It met the moment. It, you know, if you think about the, the time right before that, you know, there was severe dissatisfaction with the way the services were spending spending money. We had a lot of innovation, you know, century series, you know, you name it. Uh, there's a lot of dissatisfaction with that. And I think as we consider reform now and, and in the future, I think we have to really take stock of what it is that we're, that, that we're trying to do with it. And I think Stephanie's point is right. Uh, if you had asked me a couple of years ago, uh, I would yeah, I would really be all in on, on more flexibility because I hadn't figured out exactly what the capabilities we, we want are. Uh, I would argue now that we, we kind of have a decent, uh, a more decent understanding and a, and a better way of, of, of kind of moving forward. I think here, the value that I would kind of propose is that is that consistency and coherence because you kind of get a sense for what you know what the what the uh, what the capabilities are going to be now it's now you got to stick to it and actually and actually produce it uh, so that's where I would leave things with John Schmidt. Okay, yeah, I was I had a substantive point, but in the interest of of not breaching schedule, um, I would just say let's continue. Uh, there are uh, reports associated with each of the brief talks that we've given. Um, Eric, John, Stephanie, and I. Um, uh, are, are happy to discuss further our findings, uh, please reach out. Um, the reports are all available online as well if you want more details. Um, so we are you know, available to, to continue talking this and we hope that the momentum that seems to exist right now behind PPPE reform uh, continues. All good, everybody. So to my uh, panelists, it was my distinct pleasure to get to meet you here over the coming uh, 
past few weeks as we prepared for this. And so I'm grateful for you for the intellectual uh, opportunity and, and what you bring to the table and, and special thanks to Navy Postgraduate School for putting this together. So with that, I think we'll turn it over to NPS. Thank you very much. Um, that ends our session. Check out our website for uh, more events that are going on. Um, have a great day. And we've got more panels going on uh, shortly. Thank you.